Good morning and welcome to adult education. We are going to be studying apologetics in action. And apologetics, we know, is a defense of the faith. Um, we might ask ourselves, why is apologetics important or why should it matter? And um, one quotation I found on a website um, was where this atheist was trying to gather more evidence against Christianity and against the triune God. And he says, um, as he's posting some more, he says, well, here are some more questions. Thank you. And please keep them qu coming. These are questions that Christians can't answer. And so it's important for us to uh, have a defense of faith. It's important for us to take apologetics seriously because there is this false rumor that there is so much that Christians can't or won't answer, that we tremble at the thought of, um, of being asked anything or that we don't use reason or, um, or thoughtfulness in uh, anything applied to faith. Now, I want to preface this whole class by saying that apologetics can be very scary. And it definitely pushes me out of my comfort zone. I'm, um, and maybe you're like me, and just not good at debate or really good under pressure. You know, um, two plus two is really easy until someone is standing there asking for an answer, 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 answer. And then all of a sudden, two plus two becomes this giant mathematical equation that's so difficult to solve, right? And that's, that's how a lot of us feel about apologetics. That's how a lot of us feel when we're asked questions, especially when there is someone who who is just asking question after question after question and won't give us a chance to gather our thoughts or take a breath. And that's one of the first things that we need to remember is that breathing is okay. Breathing is good. And it's okay to say, no, hold on, slow down, and to take a breath for yourself. Also, we need to remember that we are not answering for God, and you don't have to answer or have an answer for everything. And that, that's very different from saying there are things that Christians can't or won't answer. That's very different because there are some things that you as a Christian believer may not know yet. Or there's something very valid in the fact that there are mysteries of faith. And that's not wrong, and it doesn't mean that we are in the wrong or our faith is in the wrong. Remember that a lot of atheists, a lot of people who really fight against the Christian faith, they know scripture. They know the words in scripture, but they don't know God. They don't know God the God of scripture. This is where our first rule of apologetics always has to be that God's authoritative word, the Bible, is a living word. It is the living word of God. Um, it's not for us to analyze. It's not for us to decide which is um, accurate or inaccurate, which is worth something, which is not worth something. It is God's word, and we have to stand under the authority of God's word. So this particular class, um, Apologetics in Action, this is not geared toward um, defending Lutheranism uh, to the Baptist or the Catholic or another Christian denomination. This is really about defending the faith, the Christian faith, to those who do not believe or who question or have questions about the Christian faith. With that, I think that we can see that vital importance of being in a theologically grounded and rooted 
uh, church. And that's why Pastor Eibel and myself, um, we get uh, very protective <laughs> of theology. We get very protective of um, making sure that we are teaching and preaching from God's truth and under God's authority. So um, I, I love the, uh, the quotation, and, and this is one of our youth said this, um, but I think that she was quoting someone else, but, but she was talking about needing some good, good, thick um, theology, and she said, otherwise, we're just taking on hell with a water pistol. <laughs> I love that. I think it's so wonderful. And it presents this imagery of how important apologetics is, but how important it is to be grounded and rooted in the word and um, in, in a rooted, a theologically rooted uh, church. It's very, very important to be in a doctrinal congregation, a doctrinal church. Another thing, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Um, we can all put apologetics into action. Um, I can promise you that at any given moment in any given room, I am not the smartest person in it. And that's okay. It is all right. We don't have to be the smartest person. You may be the smartest person in the room and kudos to you. That's fabulous. But it's not, um, it's not a part of, uh, or a necessity in apologetics. Also, apologetics, a defense of the faith, um, you know, you hear debate and you automatically go to our modern version of a debate, which is not a debate on thoughts, a debate on, um, on uh, ideas, but it's debate now has become this shouting match. That's not the witness that we want to bring as Christians. What kind of witness does that deliver? What defense do we have of our loving and peaceful faith if we are trying to shout someone down? Allow for questions to be asked, and that doesn't mean that you're allowing um, rudeness or allowing uh, cruelty or allowing someone to shout you down either. I mean, both Everyone should be respectful of one another. That's, that's in the Bible. Um, maybe not in those words exactly, but we, we love our neighbors. We treat our neighbors um, as we would like to be treated. Um, so, uh, and it's also not a win-lose situation as far as you have to prove your point. You have to have this person shout uncle or cry uncle uh, before you can talk to them about anything else. Apologetics is about presenting your faith. It's about defending what you believe, why you believe it, defending the faith that has been given to you. So it's important to remain steadfast and firm in the faith. We're not giving allowances as far as, well, maybe you've got a point. I mean, Buddha, you know, he had his ups. I mean, no, we don't make allowances um, and, and allow for that universalism or plurality, pluralism to creep in to our own faith, uh, faith beliefs and faith um, defense. Um, but we know that faith has been created in us out of, out of the mercy of God. He has called us into belief in him, into the life that he offers. And we don't know where exactly we are meeting other people in their journey. We know that there is at least a divine appointment in that place and time where they are having the opportunity to hear God's word, to hear the law and the gospel presented to them, um, regardless of how it's presented, whether it's in natural conversation um, or if it's uh, with an intentional, let's come on and talk about this. We don't know where we're meeting this person in that journey of theirs. Um, and so uh, we don't know when or where the Holy Spirit will work, but we know that we have this opportunity, that this door has been opened. We know that we have been given a faith and we know that we have God's word. We have God's word um, and he is 
always at work. So remember, you, you are not saving anyone. God is. God does the saving. It's God's work and it's to God's glory. And I think it's really important that we have kind of those ground rules um, so we don't get flustered or don't beat ourselves up if we um, don't know all the answers or, um, or, or say something that just, it doesn't come out eloquent. Um, <laughs> who's there like every day? <laughs> but um, you have faith. God has given you faith. And the more you study, the more you are engaged with his word, the more that you are engaged with him um, in, in knowing him more and more, the more you realize that there is so much more to know. And there are so many different ways that we can continue to grow in our faith. And so um, it's a never ending uh, never-ending joyful journey for us. So, um, so apologetics in action. So we are going to take some of these questions. If you have specifically been asked questions about your faith, um, and uh, and you you say, I just I don't even want to engage. I don't know how to engage and. Um, and this person seems like they just know everything they're talking about and I'm scared to talk to them about faith because here's little old me with just having belief and knowing that I love God and God loves me and you know what more can I say if you have any questions that have come to you please send them to me and we will try to tackle those together my email is malinak that's m-a-l-i-n-a-k at lwlc.com or you can go to the website and find it there you can link to it there um, so i am happy to to try to tackle some of these questions with you um, i know that at least one of our brothers uh, and sisters one one of us um, here at living word intentionally takes part in a conversation group, a discussion group of, um, of atheists and Christians that come together for the very purpose of having debate, having discussion. And so um, if you have any interest in something like that, I can certainly uh, help you um, get directed to the right place. But anyway, so the first question that we're going to tackle is why would God need 122 constants to provide life on earth? Constants are precise scientific conditions in which if altered slightly, like the earth being just 1% closer to the sun, life on earth would cease. I think this is an in interesting question that they, they place this as something that Christians won't or can't answer. I think that um, the constants and the very specific ordering of things, it really lifts up that our God is a creator of order, a creator that took that chaos of the nothingness, the chaos of the spans. If we go to Genesis um, chapter 1, so that's the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, and we start right at the beginning, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. So this is this, earth was this darkless void. There was chaos. There was nothingness. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. And he separated the light from the darkness and he called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning and there it was the first day. And then we continue in verse six, God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so, and he called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And he continues through all six days of creation, resting on the seventh day, as you know, goes through all of it, putting order into everything. Every aspect is well thought out, well planned, 
put in very precise order. So it's not a why would God need 120? It's not that he needs, right? It's that he is a God. He's God of order and of um, precision and of making sure that life is sustained. He makes this possible. Uh, if you go to Job, which I find myself coming to Job all the time. This is just a fantastic book. Um, and of course, my favorite parts within Job are um, chapters uh, 38 through 41. I believe that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 38 through 41 are my favorite. So anyway, that's beside the point. But if we look in, um, in chapter 39, so Job is, if you open your books, or your Bibles to the center, you'll find yourself in Psalms. Um, just go backwards, and that Job is right before Psalms. So if you go to Job 39, um, this is just a little bit of the order that we see that God has created. And he's asking Job, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving, calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young? The young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go forth and do not return to them. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the steep for its home? on and on with all of these very um, kind of detailed questions of, do you know how this happened? Do you know how that worked? And there are so many, um, so many things, especially in that time about the universe that um, were unknown. And so God, through his grace, has given us curiosity to learn more about his creation, curiosity to, um, to find out uh, what makes us up, how things work, to understand the 122 constants that make life possible and sustainable. Um, so I, I don't see that as, I don't see that question as something that Christians can't or won't answer. That to me, um, in the question itself, seems to lend itself to the proof that there, there is some intelligence within the design of our earth, within the design of, um, of all creation of the universe. So, um, so I think that we can definitely say that we know God is a God of order um, and uh, we can continue um, down that path uh, in, in further. I know that intelligent design and creation is something that a lot of um, atheists like to put out as proof, but I think when you get down to it um, and we can go deeper into that, um, when you consider creation, when you consider how everything works in this world, in this universe, um, there's so much thought to it. There's so much um, precision and order within it that uh, that proves and is one part of proof of, um, of God. So the second question we're going to look at is um, if God were all perfect and all powerful, don't you love that, how, it's, how it begins? If, if this was true. So if God were all perfect and all powerful, why would he do such a poor job and create such an imperfect world with its deadly earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, etc.? Okay. So <laughs> there's no if about it. God is all perfect, all powerful. Um, and he didn't do a poor job of creating. He did not do a poor job of putting this world together. He did not create um, earthquakes and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and droughts. Those... All of creation suffers under the curse of sin. All of creation 
Um, in Romans, it talks about how, uh, how creation moans under the weight of sin. And all of creation will be fully restored. Um, when God first created, everything was good. Everything was as it should be. Everything worked with this synergistic um, relationship everything one with the other. And when sin entered into the world, we're going to go back to Genesis again, Genesis chapter three. Um, when we, we read of sin entering into the world through Adam and Eve, and the Lord curses, he curses, which he told them that there would be a penalty to sin. There would be a penalty if they ate of the forbidden tree, um, the forbidden fruit. And, and he goes on to say how, um, how even man will, will not um, be in good uh, relation with creation. Um, he, says, uh, he says to the man, this is in verse 17, to the man he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. So all of a sudden we have Adam no longer you know, subduing the earth and caring for the earth and having dominion over the earth and, um, and, and working in this nice relationship with all of creation. But now we've got the earth um, popping up with thorns and thistles and he's toiling just to try to eat. And it's, it's a difficulty that now has been put between Adam and creation. Um, you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken and you are dust or you are dust and to dust you shall return. Um, so this is where we again come to that um, active will of God and permissive will of God. Does God actively will a tornado to destroy my house? No. No, he doesn't. Do we live in a creation, in creation that is still under the curse of sin? Yes, we do. Do, uh, do things happen? Yes, they do. And God allows for things to happen. Again, think about Job. All of these things happen to Job. It's not that God willed for bad things to happen, but he permitted bad things to happen to Job. So we have, um, we have an imperfect world because sin entered into this world. We do not have an imperfect world because we have an imperfect God. God is perfect and God is merciful. And in his mercy, even in the time when he was telling Adam and Eve that there would be this curse or that this curse is now upon them and upon all creation, um, he also was giving them that promise that uh, that that they would be saved, that mankind would be saved, creation would be saved. So then this comes to another question. Our third question is, if God is all just, how can he possibly punish mankind for what Adam did? So this question, it's interesting, um, it's interesting, it, it also starts out with this if. So it's already presented with this, hey Christian, I'm going to go ahead and just make you doubt. Just a little bit. And isn't that what the serpent did with Eve? Are you sure God really said this, really meant that? Are you sure if... 
So if God is all just, how can he possibly punish mankind for what Adam did? Again, we come back to, um, to the sin, that sin entered into this world. Adam and Eve were given, um, were given the uh, command to uh, be fruitful and multiply um, before, uh, before they sinned. So they could have continued forever in living in the Garden of Eden, living in perfect creation. Um, but they did sin, and that sin then entered into the entirety of creation. And so um, all of creation, it's not that it is a punishment because of Adam. I mean, it, it is, it's the original sin. Sin entered into creation, but with that then we are all born with a sinful nature. We are all born out of, um, out of imperfection. And so uh, if you think about in, in, uh, in Genesis, we're going to spend apparently a lot of time in Genesis today. In Genesis um, chapter 5, and I know we've talked about this before, but um, in Genesis chapter 5, uh, verse 3, we read, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image. And that son was Seth. So no longer was anyone, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, but Seth and all people afterward were created in the image of Adam, in the image of man sinful man and so um so we are born with that sinful nature and we know that the wage of sin is death the punishment of sin is death but this is where we have that promise that though sin entered in with one man salvation enters in and is covered by one man, by covered, covered by Christ, God, the God man. Um, so that actually, that question, I feel like that actually gives this wonderful opportunity to not only offer that law um, of sin and the wage of sin and that none of us escape sin, um, but it also offers then that beautiful opportunity as a Christian believer, um, an opportunity to share the hope and truth that we have in the salvation that we have received from Christ, that we aren't going to escape our sinful nature. We aren't going to escape um, the propensity to sin on our own. We aren't going to seek not sinning on our own but only by the grace of God um, are we able to do that. Also, part of God's um, godliness is his consistency and his justice. So if God, um, sin has entered into the world, none of us can escape it, none of us um, are, are able to um, come to the Lord except through him, by him, out of his grace or in his grace. Um, if, if he punished Adam and Eve alone, and yet that is when sin entered into all of creation, um, then he would no longer be a just or consistent God either because we are all born with that sinful nature. And so we need to trust in, um, in God and his, uh, his justice and know that we don't know, um, we don't know when and where he will work, but we do know that he is just. We do know that he is consistent in his justice and, um, and that he has uh, made it possible for us 
to escape the punishment of sin or to be saved from the punishment of sin because Jesus Christ took that punishment, that wrath upon himself. Um, I'm trying to think of why I have this marked. We'll probably get back to this next class time. Um, okay, so um, I think this is my, this is my favorite question um, that we've had or that I've read so far. Uh, <laughs> why did the little old lady that God healed one Sunday need her walker to get around again next Sunday? Was she only temporarily worthy of a healing? Okay, so I love this question because it's setting up a premise that, um, and I'm assuming, and, and this may be my mistake, and if someone had come to me and asked me this question, I would ask for more details. I would ask um, what these circumstances were because when I hear, hear this, I immediately think of... Um, denominations that um, claim powers for themselves that um, ended with the apostles, um, that claim powers for themselves um, that don't actually happen. Um, if you think, uh, you know, when, when the apostles healed, when Jesus healed people, um, we don't hear of them being blind again or um, being lame again or, uh, you know, whatever that healing, um, whatever took place. And uh, when you read um, through the book of Acts and you see these wonders and signs and miracles, they're happening to um, the unbeliever and every time it happens, people crowd around and the apostles who have um, healed one are given that opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So all of the miracles, all of the signs and wonders, they point, um, point us right to the gospel and they validate the gospel message of Jesus Christ, the gospel truth of Jesus Christ as Savior. As the Bible was put together, codified, the apostles were dying, um, the, the miraculous healings ceased. Um, it's kind of like the whole uh, speaking in tongues. You'll have some religions now or some denominations claim that you have to be able to to speak in tongues if you want to be a real Christian and um, but then the tongues that are being spoken are gibberish and and to speak in tongues is to speak in a language a real language that you have never studied and for you to be able to speak to someone in that language that you don't know and them to understand you and we see that in the book of acts where um, on that first day of pentecost that first pentecost um, they go out into the crowds and they're speaking and everyone can understand the apostles in their own language and the apostles hadn't studied different languages and yet they were able to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ with all of these people. So I would first honestly question the validity of um, the little old lady that God healed. I would question the, um, I would question it. Um, I, I'm sorry to say that, I'm not actually sorry to say, but I, I'm very skeptical of um, of a lot of those miraculous healings. I think that miracles can happen. I see them happen. I know that prayer works. I've seen prayer work. Um, so I don't, I don't discount um, God's ability to heal and God's ability to make miraculous things happen. But when we are talking about the, um, the like, pushing on your forehead and pushing someone over and they're healed, hmm, hmm, that's not, that's not, that's not. So, um, no. So, 
that question doesn't hold a lot of um, weight and it's not a matter of whether we as Christians can't or won't answer it. We have to take it back a few steps and say, what's going on here in the bigger picture? Um, and that's something else. And this is where uh, I, I find, um, I, I get very inspired when I watch um, and listen to really good um, apologetics, I don't think that's a word, but we're going to say it's a word. Um, those who engage in apologetics, I, I really appreciate um, those who are uh, very good at taking it back instead of, you know, someone saying, you know, answer this question and it's, you know, a question, we'll call it question D. And you've got someone who says, well, before we can answer question D, let's, let's go back to A and we're going to figure out A. B, C, and a lot of times the person who threw this question out there, there is no question D because A, B, and C, you walk through those and you see that it's resolved already. So um, those, I will, I will try to have a good example of that. Um, that is not my forte, so this is going to be a fun couple of weeks for me um, researching something on that. Um, but those are really, really fun to watch good, uh, good apologetics, um, taking it back. And that's what we would do with this. We would take this question back and say, okay, this is not the question we're starting with. Let's, let's go back, see what we're talking about with this lady um, and where she was and what the circumstances are. Um, so anyway, I hope that is a little bit helpful. Um, we are out of time for right now, but we have two more um, class times together and we're gonna dig in deeper. I'll have some more fun questions and I will have um, at least one, if not more, good examples of where we can pull back the question um, and, and, and bring that, a common question, and bring it back a couple steps. Um, so, we forgot to open in prayer. Not we. I. I forgot to open in prayer. My confirmation kids are always, always getting me on that. But we don't forget to end in prayer. So, let us turn to the Lord in prayer now. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you that um, though you have called us to defend our faith, the faith that you have so graciously given to us, uh, we know that we rely on you for your truth. We rely on you to um, present your truth. And however you use us for that, we thank you. And we ask that, um, that you would lead us and guide us in our studies of your word in our studies of the doctrine um, and the theology that you have given to us throughout the history of the church. Lord, we ask that you would keep our tongues untied when people start asking us questions and that you would, um, that you would give us confidence to share the faith that we have and to share your goodness and your graciousness Lord, we lift all of this to you, giving you thanks and praise always through the blessed, holy, and beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I will see you in two weeks when we are going to take some more apologetics in action. All right, God bless.